Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Chabanoff. I'll be moderating this section of the press conference. So we're going to be talking with race founder and race director David Trimble. We'll also be speaking with Gabe Lloyd, also known as the voice of the Red Hook Crit, who I'm sure you've all met. Hi, guys. How's Hi, Dan. Going, Dan? Uh, beautiful Everyone's day. still hoping Dan will uh, decide to race again tomorrow. No, thank you. We have a number waiting for you. You actually don't. That's a lie. Wait, um, this isn't Neil Bezdek? I'm not doing this. <laughs> Gabe, we're going to start with you. Um, so when we first met, we were actually competitors in the crit together. Um, that's how I've known you for a while. And then suddenly you were speaking to the whole uh, Red Hook crit community on the microphone. And I was personally wondering how that came about. Uh, yeah, in 2014, uh, the race had grown to such a point that David could no longer do everything. As remember, Red Hook Crit started off where David did everything, literally did everything. Everything you see now is an evolution of something that David had once touched and done. Uh, that included commentating, and in 2014, he could no longer do it. And he, and he looked around, and I sort of volunteered myself. D David handed me the microphone. I said, okay, I got this. Um, yeah, it was like mid-race, mid and I had, it was pouring rain, it was freezing, I was soaking wet, I was trying to, like, tell people what was going on, I just couldn't do it anymore, so I said, Gabe, take the mic, and that started, uh, started Gabe talking about the race. Yeah, I mean, thankfully I did a good enough job that your dad and your uncle recommended me for the next year, and then, uh, since then I've continued on with, with, uh, being the voice, I guess, of Red Hook Crit. I remember that year, I was a podium boy. That's right, we were both podium boys, actually. If you go through the Red Hook Crit photo archive, you'll see Dan and I doing our podium presentations. It's nice. Um, so Dave, next question is for you. I actually want to go back to that time when you were doing everything. Um, 11 years ago now, it seems crazy. Um, yeah. You know, I think we've all kind of heard the... Red Hook Crit origin story of it beginning as a way to get everybody to your birthday party. Um, but since then, it's obviously evolved so much, so much further than that. You know, you've crossed the Atlantic Ocean, you've organized races in Italy, Barcelona, London. And, you know, personally, I was just wondering um, what's motivated you this whole time to keep going, keep pushing, keep evolving this, this event. Yeah, it's uh, obviously been a very, very long journey from where we started in 2008 uh, on the streets of Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, I think the word evolution is what's kept me motivated. The race has always changed uh, a lot. Every kind of every year, it, it changes and evolves. And you know, what motivated me from the beginning was was different. Is different than what motivates me now. You know, initially it was really just for fun. I wanted to make a, a cool uh, addition to my birthday party. I wanted my bike racing friends to show up to my party. It took me three years to convince Dan to, to come to a race. Um, and then, you know, once the race started growing, we started getting sponsors. You know, then it, then it became my job. And every race, you know, we would, <clears throat> I would see, you know, what I could improve. And my motivation was to, at the next event, improve everything that I saw previously. And then after that event, I always wanted to improve the next one. And and I think it's just, the motivation just comes from this, this never quite feeling satisfied with where the race is at, always having new ideas on how to make it exciting, uh, seeing the success of it. You know, you, you get a great idea, and then you put it in place, and then it works, and then you, you feed off that success. So just, just the motivation of seeing the race keep growing after all these years has kept me motivated. And it, it's not easy. It's not a, you know, there's... There's, there's definitely times where you're just wondering why you're doing it, and but then you remember that like the next the next race that's going to come up is going to be better than the be, better than the last one. So b building on that a little bit, um, you know, the first time you came to Milan was uh, with the race was nine years ago. You know, since then, um, I feel like people think that you know you and Red Hook has brought something unique to Milan and to the European scene, so to speak. But, you know, I also feel like the Italians in particular have given so much back to the race. 
Um, you know, what, what do you think in particular you took away from your experience putting on races in Italy for nine years now? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, you know, the first race in Milan in 2010 was really our first kind of proof of concept of, of the track bike crit format. Uh, before then, it was, just, it was just a small local race in Brooklyn, and, and it really wasn't, it hadn't kind of reached the greater cycling world yet. And the first time we came to Milan, I came over with a few of my friends, some of the American riders. I really didn't know if I was going to be doing a race with 10 American friends and nobody else. I had no idea that like, we were going to have any, anyone locally racing. And, and that first race in Milan was the biggest race we ever had. The Italian cycling culture immediately embraced it. And they really took it and ran with it. They, they developed it into an international sport as much as we did. They started hosting races all over Italy, de designing their own championships, having a local series in Milan. And then they started coming to Brooklyn. You know, the first time an Italian team raced in Brooklyn was two, 2011, and I couldn't believe that, you know, people from Italy would come to my, my little event in Brooklyn. And I think it, it helped me kind of realize the, the, the global nature that the, this sport has. Um, I would say this question is for both of you, but, um, you know, speaking of the Italian National Fixed Gear Championships and the, that... The, the way the sport is moving seemingly in that direction of being more recognized and more official, I'm wondering what both of you think about that. I, I think it's great. I mean, the more races, the better. And if, and if you can put on more races because the federations are involved and they're more official and it's better for the organizer, I think it's really great. So, you know, really, you know, cycling needs more great, big events, more you know, well-organized races. They need, there needs to be races all the time, and, you know, the more people working on it, the better. This format is obviously an amazing format. It works very well, and the more people pushing it, the better. Yeah, I mean, it, just to add to that a little bit, I think that uh, having more races is definitely a benefit. It's a matter of also understanding, though, the cultural aspect that goes along with this style of race, where, um, you know, th these races are, s are different than other events because of the community, because of the camaraderie and the friendships that are really formed throughout the world. And, um, you know, I would, I would encourage the other pr race promoters to also look at that aspect and um, really keep the community component as much a part of the event as the start and the finish of the bike race. Uh, building on that a little bit, Gabe, um, obviously since 2014 you've sort of built a career for yourself as a race announcer, uh, also an event promoter. You put on your own race in Pennsylvania. Um, what, what have you taken away from Red Hook and brought to those events or try to bring to the greater like, cycling community or the cycling event promotion industry? Yeah, um, yeah, th I mean, yeah, that is very true that I did start my career as an announcer here at Red Hook Crit sort of by happenstance, right? By David handing me the microphone. And then I sort of ran with it. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed being part of the scene. And, and I found that I was um, more of a positive influence with the microphone than I was in the races uh, at certain times, as we all know. So um, I was able to give get a lot out of being involved with it, but really what I learned out of these events is the whole scene. And what David has taught us, and, and Jonah as well really, is that it's more than simply putting up fence and having a start-finish line and a timing counter. It's really so much about the whole piece, the whole, um, the whole day, the, now the whole weekend that has been built out of it. And what we try to bring into our events now in America is that culture, but I'll tell you, it's very challenging. I mean, what we have here is unique and it's special, and it's because it's been built up um, with the leadership of, of David here, you know, really guiding that and sometimes being stubborn, yeah. but sometimes also really understanding the final vision and really understanding the nuances of what makes weekends like this so special. So David, back to you then. Um, I think the question that everybody really wants to know the answer to is what, 
what is going to be the future of these events? I mean, we, ha we haven't had any announcements of races for next year. Obviously, the season was a little bit smaller this year with only two events. Um, where, are we, where are we going from here? Yeah, obviously, the multi-million dollar question. I think I've been asked that already 50 times today, is what, what's happening uh, in the future. I don't have any definite answer right now. I can't say exactly what the plan is, but there's basically kind of three directions it could go and you know we're we're working really hard behind the scenes to to have direction um, first off it, it could stop you know there's a chance that there's going to be no races next year uh, it takes a lot of money it takes a huge amount of effort it takes a lot of people being motivated to, con to make it continue to make it continue personally I've accomplished everything I ever wanted to m more than I ever wanted to in cycling I have a lot of interests outside of cycling I don't have to produce races forever so there's definitely a chance that it couldn't it might it may not continue next year that being said I say this every year and every year I find a way to make it continue um, if, if it continues, there's basically two more two directions it can go. It can kind of continue as it's been, where we really just rely on sponsors and kind of scraping by and making events happen, you know, as, as good as we can with the resources we have. Um, this year, we saw we saw the calendar shrink. That was because we had enough resources to do two events, so we did two events. We weren't gonna do more than we could afford. We weren't gonna go into debt to make make keep races alive and it i'm i i like the race at the level the current level it's at it's not a professional sporting event there's a lot of professional athletes racing but it's not a professional sporting event nobody's making a lot of money nobody working on the race is making a lot of money it's still just really fun and it's it's very hard to keep it at this level because when you're not growing people actually feel like you're going backwards even if you're not um you know, it almost feels like a failure when the race doesn't add some huge new element each year or a new city. So, and, it, and it's also hard to keep sponsors interested when you stay at the same level. You know, sponsors want to be involved in, in the next, you know, the latest and greatest thing. They want, they want to see innovation and they don't necessarily want to spend more, but they want to get more for their money. So, you know, one, one direction is just trying to keep it growing organically as we have keep getting the sponsors, you know, getting our current sponsors signed back on, getting new sponsors and, and continuing it this way. The, you know, the last direction, which I'm also working very hard at, is making it much bigger, making it a more professional event. Um, the future of sports right now is, is going to be live streaming on, on digital platforms. You know, all the big platforms right now are, are ready to invest a lot of money in sports. There's Facebook Live, there's Amazon Prime, there's ESPN Digital, Eurosport. There's a lot of money right now uh, being invested in sports, and we really think that the Red Hook Crit is tailor-made for these platforms. We we think it's extremely it's going to translate extremely well into live streaming, into the kind of the future of sports. Um, so we're we're going at, we're going after it. We don't have a deal yet, but we, we're we're having some conversations. If we are able to bring it to the next professional level, a lot is going to change. Um, you know, big big deals means big money means you know it's going to become a professional sport. All right, uh, let me bring it back around to this weekend. Um, we'll start with Gabe. But uh, what do you think? You know, who do you think is going to win, men or women? Oh, the classic question. Um, Milano is always such an amazing race because it is so special to the Italians. And uh, it has also meant that a lot of different tactics have been employed at this race over the years where we generally get to see a new rider cross the finish line at the end. Um, only, I believe, Raquel and Maria Sparotto are the Italians who have won this event in the past and uh, we'd love to see an Italian but I, I do think that there's an opportunity in the women's field for a very strong uh, breakaway to occur again similar to what we saw when Raquel won her event in 2016 and then in the men's side I would have to say that uh, the Italians are very motivated Pipo, Fortin uh, and, and Davide Vigano very motivated to, to be the first Italian to win this event. 
And but I have to say, Justin Williams has been really um, inspiring to watch this year. I got to call his races at USA Cycling Nationals this year, and he won a hundred mile road race and he won the Criterium. And you guys should have seen that last lap where he won that crit. He was 20 seconds behind the guys who finished behind him with one lap to go. So Justin, now that was a geared bike criterion, but I think what I learned out of that event is that when Justin has true motivation, Justin steps it up to a whole nother level. So those are my thoughts for our men's race. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to commit to picking a winner, though. Uh, for the women? And the men. Um, I'm going to have to go with Ralph Lemieux for the women. Um, Roth has shown throughout the year, even though we haven't had Red Hope criteriums, that Roth has been continuing to compete at a really high level. She won the Quebec Championship Series, which is a really hard series to win. And um, she's always, she's very nice off the bike, but when she gets on the bike, she is very tough to beat. Um, so I'm going to say Roth for the women and for the men, uh, Justin Williams. All right, David, same question. Yeah, I... Uh First and foremost, I'm just like a huge fan of the race. That's actually one of the main reasons I keep it going. I really get excited about the rivalries and the, the different teams and tactics and, and all the dynamics. And yeah, I, picking a winner is tough. You know, you have your you have who you think's gonna win and who, who you kind of want to win. You know, even though I'm not supposed to want anyone to win, but <laughs> it's more it's more kind of based on who who would be good for the race to win, but. In the, in the women's side, I, it's, I think it's just going to be a, a duel between Raf and Raquel Barberi. I think, you know, unless someone new proves us otherwise, I think they're on another level. I think they're really just, they just need to watch, watch out for each other. They're most likely going to be off the front in a, in a small move, and it's going to come down to a, a sprint between them. Uh, I, can't, I can't see anyone beating Raquel. I think she's... I think she's unbeatable in this format. She's a world champion on the track and has won both races she's entered. Um, I think I think Margot Viggy could make the race complicated for them. Um, yeah. But she can't, you know, she, you know, maybe a 10-lap solo breakaway at the start of the race is spectacular, but it's not necessarily the way to win a race. And for the men, uh, will an Italian finally win the men's race? Yeah, the, men, the men's race is also very interesting. You got uh, all of Team Specialized versus uh, Filippo 14, really. Um, the tough part there is that they're both, you know, Filippo 14 and Justin Williams, the two kind of team leaders, are both sprinters. So, and, and we've seen a breakaway go in the last three years in Milan. So if, you know, if Specialized is busy setting up Justin for the sprint, they're also going to be setting up Filippo 14 for the sprint. And we saw what happened in Brooklyn, where Filippo just rode around the outside of Justin on, on, in the end. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be very interesting if, you know, how Specialized is going to react to breakaway attempts. There's a lot of fast riders here, very, very um, strong riders who, if they get a gap off the front, they're not coming back. Um, maybe Specialized burns all their matches, bringing those guys back, and then 14 wins the sprint. I think that's probably the most likely scenario. But the, you know, a lot of these new, new guys coming in are, are very accomplished cyclists. There's, I think, 30, 40 new guys here that are strong. And even if five of them turn out to be competitive, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make an impact on the race. Any, anybody who has a question and they want to come up and ask David or Gabe, please feel free before we move on to the athletes. I am Ash Dubin. <laughs> Um, all right. let's, hear, let's hear what you got. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, out of all the races you put on for Red Hook, which has been your favorite and why? Over all the years? or Yeah, over all the years. Oh, man, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> the favorite race? Yeah, favorite race out of, of all time. I don't know, Barcelona last year was pretty good. That, I would have to say that might have been my favorite. You know, Ash Dubin won, so... <laughs> And then David Van Aird won. It was kind of unexpected. It was really, really special atmosphere. It was great having like a rider who has been around the race for so many years, um, who had won kind of in the early days and then hadn't won for a long time to, to make her way back to the top step was, was really special. 
Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, actually. I really thought that was a really special race last year. Um, not to take away from anybody else's victories. I mean, last year was tremendous. We had different winners at all of our races. Eight separate winners last year, which is, some, I think that's a first. Yeah? yeah, that's definitely a first. So it was a really special year as a whole. And even this year's Brooklyn was really a, a fantastic event. I really love seeing Anara Albusto and Margot Vigi really start to use team tactics in the women's race, for example. But I'd have to agree with David on that. Barcelona last year was really cool, right? When when you won your race over Inara, um, you know, you employed tactics and you showed that there's there's still a lot to be said for being cunning in these races, not just powerful. Um, and then Davide Venner, like, what a phenomenal kick at the end of that race. Uh, I mean, I did not expect him to win that race even into the final turn. And he, like, really dug in and went for it. So I really appreciated that effort that he put in there. So, yeah, uh, we agree. Last year, Barcelona. Yeah. All right, everybody, let's get our press conference for Red Hook Crip Milano number nine with our featured women underway. My name is Gabe Lloyd. I'm the voice of the Red Hook Crit. And with us today, we have some very accomplished athletes in our Red Hook Criterium series. On the far end of the table, Ash Dubin, a multiple time winner of our events and the 2016 series champion. Next to her is Raquel Barbieri, a world champion on the track and a two-time winner of Red Hook Criteriums. Next to her, Ralph Lemieux from Quebecois. Uh, she is the winner of London and Brooklyn in our series. And next to her, we got Sammy Fox from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Sammy did her first Brooklyn, first Red Hook Criterium event ever in Brooklyn this past year. She finished in the top 10, and so we have her up here as a new perspective on the evolution of what we're doing here today. So we're going to start off with uh, Ash down at the far end of the table. So Ash, the sport of fixed gear uh, racing has changed a lot since 2013 when we first saw you in Brooklyn. In that time, you've won multiple Red Hook Criteriums. You won the 2016 championship through consistency. Have you grown with the race or have you found that you need to push a lot harder to stay up with how the evolution of the sport? Um, I, I definitely think it's changed. I think it's changed a lot. Uh, as you said, it's grown, the field's gotten faster, stronger, smarter. Um, I started racing bikes uh, in general around 2013, so I was kind of new at that point. Um, and I mostly, before that, rode around on the street, commuting uh, New York, LA, rode fixed gear a lot. Uh, and then I transitioned to road earlier, or in that year, 2013, really. Um, and yeah, so I think as I've been getting stronger on the bike, road bike, training there, um, it's kind of translated to the, the race as well. So I hopefully I'm keeping up as it, as it moves along, but yeah. Great, yeah, I think that your evolution within the racing series throughout the years has been really interesting. We talked, uh, David and I spoke briefly earlier about your win in 2017, um, showing that you are growing, but in a, in a slightly different way, as you said, because you have a different background. Um, so it's great to see you continue to be competitive, even as we are six years into your career here with us at Regidor Crit. And I think one more thing, too, is just getting to know the field. Like, there are a lot of same people that I've been racing around, um, and even new people. So it's kind of learning how they race, what their strengths are and weaknesses, and, and keeping an eye on that. So. We're gonna to move to Raquel here, our world champion on the forum today. Raquel, you have won both of the Red Hook criteriums that you have started, Barcelona and Milan in 2016. Two years out from that win though, right? We are now in 2018. The Peloton has changed a lot. It has improved a lot. We have Raf Lemieux here who is starting to really figure out the races. Ash is winning races as well. We see new faces here with Sammy Fox. How do you see the development in Red Hook Crit Peloton 
since we last saw you in 2016? Yes, I was um, in the Redux Criterium for the first uh, time in 2016. And uh, I think uh, that uh, was a good level. But yeah, last year I don't race. I, I was, I was uh, not in the race, but uh, I was to, to see the race. And uh, I saw a good level. I'm sure that uh, this year will be most strong rider. And uh, I think uh, the girls that race uh, the Reduc need to training a lot because the level is really high. That's right, I agree. I think that the level has gotten very high in the women's field, training becoming a lot more important for everybody as the level has continued to increase. So speaking of that, we're going to move to Raf Lemieux. Raf is from Montreal. She is done a very excellent job the past few years now winning in London over a very what we thought was a very competitive field Danny King now Danny Rowe was in that race um, and you've also just won in Brooklyn this past year you ended up with the win in Brooklyn but after a lot of teamwork had been displayed in that race by Santa Fixie BLB both Ainara El Busto and Margot Vigi were really working well together and it took your teammate Carla Nafria to bring back Margot right at the end of the race and from that it seemed that that was how you at least had the opportunity again to win because Margot had already been off the front. Can you talk at all about whether or not team tactics are now becoming very important in the women's peloton and red hook criteriums. Yeah, I think it's something important. Like um, Ash said, we are stronger, we train hard, but now we play with the tactic too. Uh, don't forget that cyclists is a team, team sport, and I think it's really important to, uh, to have new strategy with team. And with what we saw at uh, Brooklyn with the Evan team and uh, Margot, and um, I think it will be a little bit the same uh, here at Milan. That's right. So Aventon Factory Cycling did a great job as well with Lisa Warner, Esther Walker. They were yeah. also attacking a lot, and that put a lot of pressure on the other team. So maybe we will see that in Milan. I hope well. so. So we'll move on to Sammy the Fox over here. Sammy's from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, very close to my home in America. So, Sammy, this will be your second Red Hook Criterium ever, making you one of the newer riders in the field. Can you talk at all about how you learned about the Red Hook Criterium series, and then did the race itself meet your preconceptions of the event? Yeah, so I learned about Red Hook through a group of these crazy Swiss guys who called themselves the Zuri Mumus uh, because I was uh, living in Zurich at the time and I had just started riding my bike and joined their weekly rides that they just did these crazy rides on fixed gear bikes every Tuesday night riding through the dark in the cold chasing Strava comms and um, they, they said, yeah, they actually made a video uh, about their trip to Milano. Um, so that's how I learned about Red Hook and I, I really thought these boys were crazy. And then they were like, one day you're going to do it, Sam. One day you're going to do it. And so, uh, yeah, then I was there in New York and they came too. And I'm hooked. <laughs> so I'm here now too. Awesome, yeah. very cool. And it did, it actually probably more than met my expectations. It was just hot from the gun and kind of caught me by surprise and uh, it stayed that way the whole race. So, right, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute with all of you, right? Do you think that the um, racing dynamic at Red Hook Criteriums is different from some of the other races that you do? Now, Raquel is raced at the top level on the road. Um, so a world tour level essentially for women um, and but you all have been very competitive at other levels and other disciplines of cycling but where do you see Red Hook Criterium uh, race dynamics fitting in? 
Yes, I race a lot, just not only track, also road, and I think uh, the Reduc uh, Crit, the, the difference of the Reduc Crit is that uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm really happy to be there because uh, I'm sure that uh, anyway, with, uh, w which will be my result, for sure I will be uh, funny, and this is really important because, yeah, I know that some uh, important race you start for just try to win and stop. But for a Ducrit, it's not only win, but uh, enjoy. Yeah, and it's fun the day before, here the track, at the party tonight, during the race, after the race. It's all the time fun, is what is really important. <laughs> I, I think it's great because the, everybody is there because they want to be there and they're having fun and that shows in the race with how aggressive all the riders are, how willing to just go for it they are. There's not uh, too much hesitation as I think at least in the U.S. racing criteriums at the higher level, it's, it's always going, at least for me because I'm not at the higher level at the front of the pack. But then at, at the lower level, it's kind of always looking around and is somebody going to go? And here, I just love that it's, it's always go. So. Um, I think one thing that also makes it stand out is, yeah, the amount of effort and details you put in this race, how everything is kind of thought out, every single thing. And as David was saying, better, or saying earlier, he wants every race to be better than the last, to improve on things. And I think that's something great you do uh, to pay attention to that because so many like you know sanctioned events or organized cycling, they they stick with one tradition, one way. The officials act one way, where they don't innovate or really change uh, to move for the future. And I think a lot of what you're doing is like pushing the sport to go into the future, um, as well as bringing a whole new. Uh, audience and like fan base into this because uh, it's accessible on so many reasons for so many reasons um, the bikes are more affordable like there's also like the fashion aspect and just the personalities how we really focus on the racers so yeah <laughs> that's great to hear and I uh, there, there are a lot of details about this race series in particular but let's back out a little bit as our sort of final question before we open it up to the audience do you think that the sport of fixed gear criteriums has, has the potential to live outside of a Red Hook Criterium series? There are other races happening in the world. Do you see them also finding those details and stepping up and, and continuing to further the sport of fixed gear criteriums? Uh, I think there's definitely opportunity there, and it is growing. Uh, and especially since most of these races are overseas in Europe, um, it's more accessible for the people in Europe to travel to more events. Uh, and it's you know also the healthcare thing in the U.S. that's not good if you get injured at the race. But uh, it'll make the U.S. people harder to come here. But it's nice that they can probably have like a, a larger base of people that start to grow with the race. And I think a lot of the, the little ones coming up, they could definitely grow and like especially learn from you guys is a model. And then you'll probably be there to provide guidance or help them with anything. Uh, and that's the great thing about this. Like you can ask so many people for help and the community is so closely knit. But yeah, I think the other races will start to grow. It'll take some time, but <laughs> Uh, we see it a little bit in Quebec, then there are more people, more race, and uh, now the Quebec Federation of Cyclists is with the fixed gear. And, and for the young kid, I think it's really good. The fixed bike is not expensive, and this can be your first bike. It costs a thousand, and you have a bike, and you have really a lot of fun. And I think it's growing up, and we have more and more race, but at the same time, I think the red oak crit stay on the top. It's bring everything together, but at the same time, it's the real goal. Yeah, I think uh, the same, because uh, I think um, there is a lot of uh, women and men, and um, there is a lot of fans, and this is, uh, the, this is super important, because uh, in, a, in a road race, something, yeah, there, is, there isn't uh, fans, uh, and yeah, just, okay, 
maybe it's an important race, but not follow like uh, Reduc and Reduc is incredible. I remember last year, last year in um, Milano, I was a spectator and uh, I was super happy because it was full of uh, guy. I what I hope uh, really spreads to other cycling venues is the equality and gender because I think it's the only cycling event I've ever been to where we really have just as many fans for the women as the men. And it's like, it's thrilling, the whole, the whole thing, whether you're in the women's race or the men's race, um, I've never been at a cycling event with that much equality. So that's, I, I hope people are catching on to that. That's great to hear, we definitely strive for that. So it's great that you guys uh, feel the same way. With that, my questions are concluded, but we'd like to open it up to anybody here today. Does anybody else here have any questions for our select women for the Red Hook Criteria Milano edition this year? Ash, what is your favorite Red Hook crit ever? Since you asked me the same question. Oh, oh. And, and, what, and a follow-up to that, what's been your favorite after party? Maybe I'll start with the after party. Um, I think was the one in London. Uh, I don't remember the year when we had the boat. It was like there was a boat off the London course by the O2 Arena. I think it was that was that 2015? was the first year. Yes. Yeah, 2015. So the first year of London. That was super cool. Um, and they always end way too early. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I was sad that that ended early, but um, yeah, that's probably my, my favorite. It was a good dance session there. Um, my, and I, I was actually stay close to the race that time. Normally it's not fun, like trying to get home after, but. And you, you, fa you famously missed the after party in Barcelona last year. I know, I was going to get to that. I had the prize bike, my bike, and a bunch of other stuff, and I couldn't really put it anywhere. That made me extremely sad because I saw those Photos of people jumping in the pool they weren't supposed to be in, and it looks really awesome. So, uh, yeah, I was a little bummed. Uh, my favorite race, I, I really did enjoy Barcelona, even though I didn't get to uh, go to the party. Oh, and one more, sorry, I just like a lot of things. There was a, I think it was in Barcelona, where we had kind of, like, that one night when we were on the beach and stayed out super late, it's... Um, yeah, the only time I've really seen David kind of go crazy, so, yeah. But yeah, he can it, have it was fun like a 6 a.m. ride back to the city with the oh, yeah. broken bike. And then he ran into Tito's wheel or something and uh, destroyed the, the wheel he was on. It was on a Red Hook bike, so. <laughs> All right, la last question for everyone. Uh, what's everybody's gear ratio for tomorrow? And you have to be honest. The gear ratio, what gear are you going to run? I can go first. Yeah. I have a Gates belt drive, so my gear ratio is 70-20. <laughs> All right, 70-20. That's pretty good. What? Somebody do some math. <laughs> yeah, I don't know as the, the race gets faster, I kind of change and play around, but for years I always did 48 15, which is pretty spinny. Um, yeah, it all depends on the course, because this one's not as technical, so probably a heavier gear for sure. <laughs> all right, we'll ask this question again on the podium tomorrow. All right, thank you, Dave. And uh, I think that'll conclude our press conference for our featured women here today. Let's hear it, everybody. If you're here, give, put your hands together a little bit for our featured women at the Red Hook Rip Milano number nine press conference. My name is Gabe Lloyd. We had Ash Dubin, Raquel Barbieri, Raph Lemieux, and Sammy Fox joining us here today. You'll definitely see them tomorrow in Bovisa. Thank you guys so much for coming out and please stick around for our men's press conference up next. Four seats, five guys. Four seats, five guys. <laughs> You can sit on my You can sit. I was going to say you can sit. Move up, boys. All right, everybody. We're going to get started with our men's press conference for Red Hook Crit Milano number nine. My name is Gabe Lloyd. Joining me up here, we have Davide Vigano, Alec Briggs, Justin Williams, Kai Frohan, 
and Frank Martucci. We're going to ask each of these guys a question or two, and then we will open up questions to the audience. So if you have any questions for our athletes, think about it and be ready to come on up at the end. So we're going to start with Justin, actually, here in the middle. Justin, we've had other riders come to Red Hook Crit and gradually improve, but you're the first to go from finishing midfield in one race to fighting for the win at the next start. What's changed for you, and what role did fixed gear racing play in getting back to enjoying racing bikes? Nah, nothing really changed. Um, I just took it a little bit more seriously. Um, and yeah, it was because of the environment of like uh, the culture in LA uh, with Fixie Racing. Uh, it just made it easy for me to kind of relate and, and dick around and still have fun while, uh, while riding and racing bikes. So the enjoyment factor of just in general, being able to enjoy your training as well as racing? Yeah, just being able to enjoy, yeah, exactly. Enjoying, enjoying the training just as much um, as the racing and uh, being around people that, you know, wanted to get better and, and kind of made me want to be better. Right on. That's great. We're going to move next to Davide Vigano down there racing for Team Cinelli, or Cinelli Team now, apparently. It's the same. It's the same. Okay. So, Davide, you have never finished worse than fourth in a Red Hook Criterium, but you've also never won a Red Hook Criterium. That consistency earned you the 2017 Red Hook Criterium Championship. But as we've covered so far, an Italian has never won in Milan. Okay. What would be an example of a race winning strategy for you to become the first Italian to win in Milan? We have two strategy. The first one is Ask to the other guys if I can be the first guy, Italian guy, who win uh, Milan. <laughs> I can be? Yeah. Okay, so one. I will be. <laughs> Great. But the second one is uh, try to attack because Justin is really fast, 14 is really fast, so for me, <laughs> <laughs> he's really fast. <laughs> So for me, it uh, can be easier to try to attack and try to win the breakaway. Great, that's great. Uh, one follow-up question to that. You have raced in the World Tour for yeah. very large teams, and then you started to race fixed gear criteriums. What was the hardest thing for you to change coming from World Tour to racing in fixed gear crits? Last year was my first year uh, after my career, no? And uh, everything was easy. was easy. This year is a little bit hard because uh, I can ride in the race, uh, and I can just train, so my condition is a little bit different and I have to, to find a new strategy. <laughs> just this. Right, so maybe we'll see that strategy tomorrow, we'll see. I think so. the first one was the best one. I think so, maybe. We'll see what happens out here. Alec. This is Alec Briggs. Hello. So Specialized Rocket Espresso has demonstrated very consistent, cohesive teamwork with multiple members of the program over the years. Right, so even an evolution of your program, so to speak. We've already covered that Milano has not come down to a field sprint in the past few years. And in fact, Milano has been a breakaway situation the past three years. Because you guys have worked so well as a team, does that put pressure on you particularly to execute that teamwork and keep any, any sort of plan together for anybody else on your program? Uh, I think what's quite good about our team is that I think we're all happy for any of either of us to win. And uh, if Justin goes out the road, Stefan, Iman, Gus, who's not even here yet, um, you know, it's, it's all good. Uh, we're, quite, we're in a very fortunate position where we all get along and we all have fun riding bikes. So if one of us goes up the road, 
it's all good. And if it comes down to a field sprint, yeah, we've got the power to kind of string it together and see if we can deliver someone to the finish. But so let me ask a specific Milano question. A few year, two years ago, I believe, um, a, with uh, well, last year actually, with I'll ask about last year because we were here. You weren't here, but. Ivan Cortina countered the first lap prime. Ale Mariani jumped on it immediately, specialized, looked like it had a lot of pressure on it to bring back the move, but waited too long for that. Was that because you, there was only your team able to do the work, or do you think that there were other factors that contributed to that gap opening up as quickly as it did? Yeah, I think we as a team were the, the only ones who wanted to bring it back the most. I think other people had other motives to sit in, which is totally cool. Um, this year, there isn't that. No one, you know, GC is so tight and uh, it can go to anyone. No one wants to let anything go up the road, which is cool. It's going to be a wicked race for everyone to view and I think it would just be countering, attacking left, right and centre and who knows what's going to end up in the finish. Uh, yeah, I think last year, you know, everyone kind of got stunned by how quick those two went away. Uh, everyone learned something, you know, gear changes are going to change this year. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different factors. I learned a lot last year and I think as a team, you know, I think me, Stefan and Iman can definitely feed that down into the rest of the team. And everyone knows how good of a field is coming up for this race. No one can be, no one can be let go. It's everyone's got something to, everyone's got something in, you know, a card to play. Right, so like last year, Davide, you were wearing the jersey in Milan, and you were, you were almost okay with the breakaway last year because it allowed you to get points at the end uh, to secure that jersey, whereas this year, that is not the case, right? Like the, G, the overall is still very tight, and anybody could really come away with that jersey. Would you agree? Yeah, last year for me was uh, really easy because uh, I just look. I was looking just for the GC. <laughs> I was not ha not happy about the breakaway because uh, I will I I prefer to try to win Milan because uh, I want to be the first Italian guy to win Milan. <laughs> but uh, in the end, uh, I did what I had to do. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's jump down to this end of the table. I've got Frank Martucci here. Martucci has uh, the most starts of any of our Red Hook Criterium athletes in our history. Joining us in Brooklyn in, what year was that, Frank? First Red Hook was Milano, 2011. And then uh, after a couple of uh, months, it was uh, uh, Brooklyn. So yeah, it was in 2012. That's right. So in 2012 was, was the first time we saw you at Brooklyn number five. And uh, since that time, you've now also become a race promoter yourself here in Italy, promoting a few fixed gear criteriums. Um, can you talk at all about how fixed gear criteriums have evolved and also what they've learned from Red Hook Criterium events? Uh, fixed gear right now in Italy are um, really specific races, so Riders are uh, really training hard, uh, prepare uh, everything, bikes, everything from uh, um, for this kind of race. And uh, years ago was a bit different because uh, any time there were some uh, riders uh, coming for from the first time, so they um, they were uh, uh, experimenting, they were trying for the first time this kind of uh, uh, race. Right now it's uh, more close than uh, Red Oak, uh, so. Uh, we have uh, some uh, qualification in the afternoon and then uh, uh, the final like uh, Red Hook uh, because uh, riders are uh, so many so there is not space enough for uh, everyone and uh, um, the big final uh, it's really fast also um, riders from Italy are really strong uh, you see in uh, Red Hook there are so many in the top uh, uh, top 20 so red um, criterium in Italy right now are uh, really, really fast, really um, close to Red Oak. So a really nice as a train for, uh, for this race. Yeah, that's great to hear that you have so many participants that you have to run qualifications the same as we do here, uh, just so that you have a reasonable 
field size in your feature events in Italy. Um, but let's jump to Kai, because Kai is a Dutch rider, and they have the uh, Dutch Cup Crit Series, the NL Series there. Um, so Kai, can you talk about your experiences with the Dutch races as well, and then maybe add a little bit to how that has helped you prepare for Red Hook Criteriums, because you are in the top 10, even though you're one of the youngest riders here, overall, and you have shown consistent improvement at every single Red Hook Criterium that you've done over the years. So have the Dutch Cup crits helped you with that? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I started last year in April, uh, and I was too late to uh, start in Brooklyn, but like there were a lot of races in the Netherlands, and we have like 10 races each year, um, and that helped me a lot. And if you see like guys like David Van Uert, Tim Sriza, who's almost every race uh, he starts, and like uh, the guys from Fast, and there are a lot of uh, other Dutch guys. And I think it's a good preparation because it's spread out over the year. And like uh, we had the last one uh, last week, a week before Milano, and I think that's like the best preparation you can have for Red Quit. That's great. And are the Let's open this up to everybody here then. Would you say that the, the, the race dynamics in a Red Hook Criterium are different from other races that you do? And that could be uh, whether we're talking about our Italian series and the Dutch series or in America with our criteriums that we do at home. Alec, I think that you have a, you've been racing a, quite a bit and Davide, now you're training on the track again. Um, and you've also raced at the World Tour. So all of you have very different types of experiences but how does the Red Hook crit differ in the overall race dynamic? I think that's what's quite beautiful about the Red Hook crit series and fixed gear racing in general. It just like brings a load of different riders from different backgrounds together. And uh, different courses can draw out different strengths and a different rider can win on any different day. So it's uh, you gotta be on your game. I think it's, we've seen in the past, it's, it's put some very good riders in their place. And uh, yeah, to be a good Red Hook crit rider and a fixed gear rider in general, you've got to be a little bit good at everything. And um, I think just chilling out and getting on with it is a big part of it as well. Chilling out and getting on with it. Kai Verhoen, do you want to speak at all about that sort of chilling out and getting on with it component? Because you are known for cracking jokes on the start line um, and having a good time with these races. Yeah, you... I, I raced a lot of UCI races when I was a junior. And everyone was just like all stressed out and like um, always like uh, not making jokes but like trying to talk bad about people and like uh, talk people down. And I mean, it's so chill. I mean, even we are all conquerors. It's like super nice to to see everyone like four times a year. This year only two times, but like it's super good to, to have a healthy uh, healthy rivals like. Um, I think that's good. I mean, I'm always super relaxed because I'm here for, I mean, it's fun, but we're all living for it. We all do our, try and train hard and do our best. But I think it's just the fun of a retro grid. It, the, the whole diamonds is different. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of it. I think at the end of the day, like, your best is good enough at Red Hook. And I've been in a bunch of different situations where you got to be a little bit miserable to be considered trying hard enough. Um, and like, that's just, that's dead, that's over. Um, I think that moving forward, like this will set the standard of what it should feel like in a race environment. Um, I think that if you're having fun and you're doing your best, there's nothing really more you can ask for. If you're dedicated to what you're doing, you'll get where you're going. And is that something you guys are trying to do with Endo Concepts as well in LA? Exactly, that's, that's exactly, that's the, the framework of the team is just to like be who you are. You know, you don't have to conform to anything to, to do that thing that you love. And at the end of the day, like, that's what's important. You know, everybody's looking for uh, that thing that they live for. They're looking for that meaning and that, um, that specific thing that helps you get up in the morning. Um, and that's, that's what this is developing. And I think that's why this is so important for all walks of life that are coming to the bike and, and joining in, in cycling in general. It's great to hear. You know, I think that that is a, such a crucial layer to cycling to keep it interesting and fun for people involved, right? And I, there are a lot of races that we've been a part of over the years that have sort of lost some of those moments, right? So, Frank, I'd like to close with you because you've done so many of these races 
Would you say that, um, you know, David Trimble's pursuit of improvement over the years has also been met with keeping the vibe what you remember from 2012? Yeah, the vibe, I think it's kind of the same. Maybe just uh, uh, we have more uh, professional riders, so they don't have the same vibes that we had uh, in yet. 2012 because they're coming yet. from... <laughs> they don't have the same vibe yet. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, now, because uh, the um, uh, first years uh, we came from uh, um, courier, courier, uh, so underground, uh, so um, they were more close than courier races than uh, professional races. Right now, are more professional races, so uh, I think the vibe is kind of the same. Also, the after party, especially here, we have a couple of crazy guys uh, that the after party they do really cool uh, move. So um, I think it's kind of the same. Just for uh, uh, the 45 minutes of the race, uh, we we feel like a real pro. But all the, the rest of the uh, weekend, uh, I think it's kind of the same. Very cool. Well, I'd like to open it up for any questions from people here at the Vigorelli Velodrome here today. Do we have any questions for our panel of select men? Who, who am I going to target first? Uh-oh. Um, yeah, I guess you guys, you guys probably talked about it a little bit, but Justin, like, how are you going to keep 14 from just going around you in the sprint again? <laughs> well, I think I'm faster than him, so that's the start. Um, I just, you know, those mistakes made, it was different. I've never raced a fixed gear bike in the rain, um, and I made a couple of mental mistakes, um, and that won't happen again. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to, to do well and really you know, put the team on my back, as Marshawn Lynch would say. I <laughs> um, mean, just have fun. Um, it's a race, man. You never know what's going to happen. There's, there's so many factors, and that's the best part about Red Hook, right? It's like, you got to pick the right gear. You got to have the right air pressure. You got to, you know, have the right tires. You got to be on a good day. There's so many things that can happen. And at the end of the day, the best man will win. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm happy with that. Like, obviously, I'm in my head, I want to win. And, you know, I'm not afraid to say that. Um, we're here to win, but you know, at the end of the day, I will respect whoever can come around to me. Great. Yeah, it's it's very rare to see someone go around Justin Williams, but 14's fast. Alec. So Alec and I have a bet where if he ever wins a Red Hood crate, I'm gonna get a tattoo of his face on me somewhere. <laughs> it's true. We shook on it. I made that bet a couple years ago when I didn't even think he could get on the podium, <laughs> and now he's been on the podium twice. Third. Um, in the last two years, so you're obviously getting better, but is third as high as you can you can go, or can you win one of these? Uh, I personally think I could win one, um, but I think there's maybe some other priorities first, and uh, I'm cool with that. That's no problem. Um, yeah, I think if we go back to Barcelona, yeah, I'll, I'll try and take the win there. All Got London. it. So, you, so you, you feel like you need a technical circuit to. To contest yeah, man, I, I won't lie to you. I know, I know, I haven't got the big legs to like sort of. Yeah, I, I, my land's fast. It's not my kind of course. I love something a bit more technical, but um, I know I can make an impact. Yeah. And I know I can. I, I could win there, but we haven't even worked out what we're going to do yet. Um, so yeah, wait and see on a day. But it's going to be good, whatever. Cool. Uh, now we'll go on to the next next Kai. Who do you think the, the best hope for the Dutch are in, in Milan? Do you think you can be the, the top rider? I don't know. I think David is in good shape. Uh, and we also brought some uh, underdogs. Um, yeah, can you talk about some of the new riders, the new Dutch riders that nobody um, is, is worrying about right now, but they should be? Yeah, I'm not going to talk. Nah, sure. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Edis Kelling. He's a Dutch rider for SEC Racing. And uh, he proved in road races uh, that, he, uh, that he's a very good rider. And sure, that's not a that's not like that he's automatically a good fixed gear rider, but he proved in the Anno Kid series that he's strong. Also in uh, Drive in the Kai, which is a pretty big race. Um, so I'm pretty interesting to see what he's what he got. And I mean, I think I'm in good shape, but we will see. Cool. All right, for uh, Vigano, 
I don't really have a question. I have a, more of a statement. I, I just really want to see you go on the attack on, on Saturday. Finally. Oh, but I was joking, huh? Yeah. I can win gonna, the sprint we're gonna, we're gonna hold I can you. win the breakaway, so don't worry. We're holding you, we're holding you to it. We want to see, see a big attack. Yeah, I can attack if I can choose uh, the correct gear. Because in Brooklyn, uh, my problem has been the, the gear. Yeah, the gear was too big in Brooklyn. It was correct? too big. Yeah. I started with 52, 14. Uh, <laughs> 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 was it big? It was big. Yeah. Yeah, you, you looked like you were suffering out of those corners. I did the race corners. with my head, not with my legs, uh, because uh, I was behind uh, and I was telling, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but in the end, I was fourth, so it's okay. okay. In Milan, uh, if the finish will be in the sprint, uh, I can sprint. If you want, I have a 60 for you for Milano. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in, 60, in the track, 30. I'm using 63, so I can ask the Italian team if I can use. <laughs> no, the other one was 60, 20, the girl? 70, 20. Okay. Yeah. There Vigano, you go. 70, 20 tomorrow. <laughs> I think they have a bike for you if you want it. But All right, Frank. The first time Frank ever contacted me, he sent me a Facebook message saying, my name's Frank, I'm the fastest fixed gear rider in Italy. That was the first words he ever wrote to me. Yeah, but it was in 2011. <laughs> so, um, but you're still one of the fastest Italian riders. Um, can you see yourself getting a, another top 20 or another top 10? I would like to. It's really hard right now because there are so many fast riders. Uh, we have some here. <laughs> And um, so let's see tomorrow, uh, any, every Red Oak, uh, it's different to the others, so let's see tomorrow. I, I will try for sure, but it's going to be hard for me, but I'll but, try. Yeah, honestly, do you think you can do it? Are you confident that you can get a top 20? I don't know, in uh, Brooklyn, it was, uh, it was 50 and something, I don't remember. So it's not too, top 20 is not too far, so I try, yeah. Right, we'll see you, we'll see you in the top 20. Yeah, sure. If it's, you have to pay me a beer, okay? <laughs> Deal. <laughs> there we go. He had to think about that for a bit. He was like, wait a minute. Deal. All right, everybody. Well, I think that'll conclude our audience questions, and I think that'll conclude our men's press conference here for Red Hook Crit Milano number nine. My name is Gabe Lloyd. Thank you guys so much for coming out, and please stick around, ride here at the beautiful Vigarelli Velodrome, and then come up to Voviza tomorrow and join us for Red Hook Rip Milano number nine. Davide Vigano, Alec Briggs, Justin Williams, Kai Verhoen, and Frank Martucci, everybody. Let's hear it from the audience. Few round of applause for these guys. And we will see you tomorrow at our feature event.